My name is David Johnston and I live in uh, Mount Washington, Kentucky. February the 28th, 2016. I don't know this, this is just what people tell me. This young lady pulled over in front of us and hit us head on. And then uh, it, 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 both of us went flying off the, the bike. I had a concussion. Um, I had uh, bone come out of my wrist and I had uh, my ankle was crushed. Uh, I had about uh, 20 some odd pins just stuck in the bone to hold it together and they all broke. And well, it was not healing. My foot would just, it would just get huge and uh, ache, pain. I couldn't hardly walk. So the patient was referred to me for a second or third opinion regarding um, his ankle injury. He had suffered a severe ankle and talus fracture approximately a year ago uh, in a motorcycle accident. It was a high speed accident. It was taken to local level one trauma center, um, was treated with open reduction, internal fixation of all of his fractures. Never did well post-operatively, uh, didn't heal all of his fractures, started to develop uh, a lot of pain and dysfunction. He'd seen a couple other providers in town who felt reconstructive options were limited, and he was referred to me uh, to see if there were any other options that I could give him. When I first saw him, um, he was fairly unhappy with his status. Before this injury, uh, he was fairly active, uh, did not have any pain in the ankle, was a scratch golfer playing multiple times a week, uh, rode his motorcycle frequently, which he hadn't been able to do for nearly a year. He came uh, using crutches and a fixed ankle walker with a severe limp. Uh, and clinically was fairly unhappy with where uh, his life was going for the past year. When I first saw him, uh, x-rays showed um, a lot of retained hardware around the ankle and the talus bone. Um, he appeared to have a non-union of a talus fracture um, with arthritis of the ankle and the subtalar joints. So immediately this is a very difficult reconstructive procedure with not a whole lot of options. So we started uh, in a staged manner, did a first surgery just to remove the hardware, kind of get the lay of the land, make sure there wasn't a deep infection. Uh, fortunately, there was no sign of deep infection. Um, he did have obvious gross non-union of one of his fractures. Got an MRI to look at how much blood flow to the, was to the talus bone, and it did appear impaired. He had some component of AVN. And at that point, we really had to make some hard decisions about what our reconstructive options would be. So he had arthritis on the ankle and subtalar joint with a non-union of the tailor neck. I think before the Dyna nail was available, I'm not sure I would have proceeded with trying a TTC arthrodesis with the native tailor body in place. I knew that it had impaired blood supply and I expected settling after the surgery. With a traditional intermedroy nail, uh, I would have been confident it would have failed pretty quickly. For this procedure, I wanted to really maximize two things. One, I wanted to increase as much biology as possible to uh, enhance bone growth in an impaired environment. And then obviously wanted to uh, maintain alignment and compression with uh, the hardware. To increase biology, I did a couple things. I took some uh, cancellous autograph from the patient's own proximal tibia. I mixed it with a recombinant platelet-derived growth factor to enhance bony healing. Surgery itself went very well. Was, uh, there were no significant gaps. Was able to use the bone graft uh, to fill any voids. Um, and when we were done, was able to get uh, pretty decent external compression before applying the nitinol element. So on post-operative x-rays, if you get a really good lateral of the nail, um, you can tell how much nitinol compression is remaining based on the space uh, where the compressive element is still trying to make up ground, as well as the relative position of the longitudinal screw in the calcaneus. And when we left the operating room, we still had approximately five millimeters of compression remaining in the nitinol element, which is really what my goal was. And I could see after about six weeks, um, approximately two to three millimeters of the nitinol had uh, been compressed. So at that point is when you realized if you'd used your traditional nail, which can get excellent compression at the time of surgery, but then you statically lock things, at that point I'd be worried about it already failing. Early on, at about six weeks when the patient began weight bearing, um, I was very pleased with uh, the, the amount of pain he had. I mean, this is a big surgery. Um, with a, a big reconstruction, and he had less pain at six weeks than he had before surgery. After about three months, uh, as I started to transition him out of the boot, you could really tell on x-ray where you start to get some bridging bone at both the ankle and the subtalar joint uh, with still some maintained compression left in the nitinol element. At that point, I felt fairly good about where this was going. Um, the patient did as well, and he just continued to do better over the next three to six months. 
The patient is very happy with his outcome. At this point, we've achieved a successful tibiotalocalcaneal arthrodesis. His pain has much improved. He's been able to come back to a lot of the activities he likes. He's playing golf multiple times a week. Um, he still has some obvious, some stiffness and pain in the ankle. Some of that may be related to his Taylor neck non-union that's still, still there, but he's overall, he's very pleased with how, uh, how things have gone. Of course, the first thing I asked him, when can I play golf? Okay, but, but anyway, he, uh, I mean, I could tell the difference, you know, as, as, as soon as he did that. I mean, of course, that didn't have the swelling. And then, but, uh, I mean, it was, uh, I, I don't know how to say it. I mean, you can ask my wife. I mean, you know, I wish she was here with me. But uh, she, she would say, if, I mean, the difference in the way I acted from then until after he did all this. I mean, it just, just changed everything. I played golf, and of course I played basketball with my grandkids, and softball, pitch and catch, you know, just everything, everything with the grandkids. What Dr. Lewis did for me was just amazing, you know. It, 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 it helped my life, you know. It, I guess it gave me a new life, I guess you could say. I think this is one case that really illustrates the power of the Dynanail in terms of reconstructive for patients in difficult clinical scenarios. The ability to the nail to adapt post-operatively as the anatomy changes and the bone shifts um, is unparalleled by any other implants on the market. When I first started using the Dynanail, I tended to reserve it more for difficult cases where I was worried about my Taylor bone stock or the distal tibia bone stock, where I expected some resorption either due to impaired vascularity, prior surgeries. As I began having very good clinical results with those difficult cases, I pretty much started using the Dynanail for all my TTC arthrodeses um, due to its ability not only to continue the compression, but bone tends to like uh, how nitinol performs. Um, I use nitinol in a fair other amount of applications in foot and ankle, and so it just makes sense to employ it um, in this instance.